Hi, this is Mike Spivey, the Spivey Consulting Group. It is December 14th, Monday, and I'm doing these podcasts from Reddit questions. So we're going to take a Reddit question or two every week and answer it the following week. There are actually two questions that were of interest to me. One of them, which was asked twice, was how do you pick a law school? And my COO reminded me that we have done tons of blogs and podcasts on this. So what she's going to do is she's going to link myrankbyspivy.com, which is a whole tool you can use where you can rank order your law schools by things that matter to you, not by arbitrary U.S. news rankings. She's also going to list the number of podcasts and blogs that we've already done on this, and hopefully that's helpful. So then the other question that was, I think, really spot on for people that have an answer for is, and I'm going to literally read it from Reddit word for word. Seems like there's a lot of confusion and potential misinformation surrounding Yield Protect, YP, the poster says. Does it exist to what extent in what range of schools? Where is the line drawn from this? Is someone we will give money, 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 money to? This is someone we will deny. Thanks for all your hard work. So let me take the different postulations in this and, and, and give my answers. Does it exist? Yes, for sure. It didn't always exist. Yield protection didn't always exist. The first school that started maybe hinting at yield protection was Penn. This was when I was in admission. So this is years ago, back when I was at Vanderbilt. Penn did ask a sort of why Penn question. And we thought it was yield protection. But the person at Penn at the time, the dean of admissions, is now at Spivey Consulting, Derek Meeker. But I don't think they viewed it so much as a why yield protection question. I think back then, no one was interested in that metric of rankings. And I'll explain that in a second. I think Penn wanted more writing and to get to know their applicants better. And that's how they did it. And they wanted fit. And it was even required at that time from Dean Meeker, you know, not even in the optional essay, which you would most often see, not always, but most often see if it's for uh, yield protection purposes. But I think what happened is other schools saw that question. And then during a long period, I can't remember the exact years, So when I started admissions, there was a long upward period of, it seemed like every year more people applied to law school. And then, you know, come 2000, whatever, eight, nine, when the Great Recession hit, and then maybe 2010 is when the slide started. Every year there were less and less people applying to law school. So what happened? People weren't gaining medians, they were losing them. So law schools who are under tremendous pressure in admissions to, you know, move needles somewhere, if you're not moving the LSAT or GPA needle, then they started saying, well, maybe we can move the selectivity needle. Yield is a function of selectivity. It's not selectivity, but it's a part of the equation. So what schools started doing is they started saying, well, our median is a 165 and a 3.5. Here's someone applying with a 174 and a 3.9. So they're either maybe using us for scholarship negotiation purposes or ultimate safety. Let's ask them why are they applying to our school. Let's make it optional. If they don't answer the question, let's waitlist them, right? That would be classic definition of yield protection. And then if they stay interested on the waitlist and if they you know, write a letter of continued interest, hey, I was waitlisted, but you're still my top choice because my fiance is moving to you know, your city, then yeah, let's admit the heck out of them because they help us. But if they just blow us off, then we'll just keep them on the waitlist indefinitely. And if we never hear from them, we will withdraw them from the waitlist, which is another way of saying deny them. And we get this slight fractional bump in our selectivity. On a personal note, I've looked at the data pretty closely over the last many years. And I actually think yield protection is not a great strategy. You know, I have the luxury of saying this without being a dean of admission, but I think that you're looking at such micro decibel places here that you'd actually rather just admit all the strong people and then if a few of them come, you know, and by strong, you also want to read their applications and make sure they're not jerks or sloppy or whatever. Even that two or three person bump is still giving you a, a better U.S. news metric than wait listing a bunch of qualified people. There's also sort of a principle grounding where as a gatekeeper to your law school, you know, what is your duty? Is it to increase the school in rankings or is it to admit the people you think are the most qualified for your school? I'm not going to get into that. That's an individual school's choice. But that does get back to, you know, does it exist? Does it to what extent? So I would say that there are a few schools who just, you know, don't worry about yield protection. And, you know, you can look at the top three. I think their default is if you're admitted to our school, the data 
and our brand would suggest you're going to come to our school and maybe beyond the top three, you know, maybe a few others. But generally, I think of that top three as not really caring so much about yield protection because their yield is so strong. And then you look at sort of the other end of the spectrum. There's a lot of schools, you know, there's 199 ABA approved law schools, I believe. There's a lot of them that I think are just going to not have the luxury, for lack of a better word, and that's not a precise word, but have the ability to yield protect because they need to make admits. They're certainly not going to not admit people who are slightly above their medians because they need a certain number of admits to bring in a class, particularly if they're right above their medians, they'll throw a scholarship at those people. So I think that brings me to the other part of this good question, which is where is the line drawn? I think that's a really astute question because look, if you're below both of the medians for a school and you're not URM or you know have some sort of special situation, you're probably, you're the least likely to be yield protected because the school knows that they're probably a stretch for you. And if they admit you, you're coming. So think of it in terms of you you have stretch schools, you have target schools, and you have, you know, safety schools. If you're applying to a stretch school, I wouldn't worry so much. You're not going to get yield protected. If it's a target school, if you're right around the medians, and if they give you any opportunity, if it's a school that asks a why us, if it's a school that asks an optional why us, look, the optional part, I would never consider optional. If you're interested in a school and they say you can optionally do this, do it. Because that itself is a signal to them. It's not so much, you know, the one page beautiful writing. It's the fact that you took the time to write the one page is a signal to the school. And just to be clear, by answer, everything optional, I certainly don't mean like come up with a GPA addenda, an LSAT addenda, a diversity statement, et cetera. I just mean that there are specific schools, many, that say, hey, you can optionally do this specific set of questions. Why us? What's your favorite book, et cetera. And when they present that, I would always choose at least one and answer that. Certainly, if you're interested in a safety school, That's the most likely group to yield protect you. So let's say Princeton Law has a 169 median LSAT and a 3.8 median GPA, and you have a 174 and a 3.9. So Princeton Law is probably your safety. That's the school that's going to be like, well, if they get into Starfleet Academy or Hogwarts Academy ranked above us with medians in the 173s, they're probably not going to go to Princeton Law. That's the school that's the most likely to yield protect you. So yes, yield protection is real. Yes, it happens. It doesn't happen at all schools. Hopefully I've covered the spectra of one side and then the extreme elite side. There's two simple ways around yield protection. One is answering everything optional they could throw at you without you know being obsessive. So if they say answer one of six, don't answer six of six essays. Do answer one or two if they give you that choice. The other is in letters of continued interest. If you're waitlisted and you're interested in that school, always do a letter of continued interest. This brings me to two PSAs. One is I'm getting a lot of direct messages over various platforms of social media. Hey, I was waitlisted or hey, I haven't heard from the school. Should I write them a letter of continued interest? The answer is no. The answer is yes, but no, not right now. I have a horrible analogy, but I haven't thought of a better one yet, which is I think of like these battleships that would launch like cannonballs at each other. And let's say that each ship only had the capacity to hold 12 cannonballs and you spot the enemy's ship, you know, 500 yards away. Are you going to launch all of your 12 cannonballs at that moment? Of course not, because you really only have, in this analogy, 12 cannonballs to ping law schools over the long cycle. And this cycle is, I mean, every cycle is a lot longer than I think people realize in December because people are admitted all the way up till September. So what you don't want to do is fire a bunch of stuff now that would be much better served for later. A letter of continued interest, if you're waitlisted, perfectly fits into the use it later. Schools aren't going to be admitting off the waitlist until, I don't know, March. Maybe some special interest admits in January and that'll cause a lot of excitement and or panic online in February. But the real waitlist stuff starts March, April, May, June, July, August. So if you've been waitlisted at a school... I mean, one thing you might want to do is just hold that cannonball, for lack of a better term, until 2021. Don't do it now. My second PSA is, I would say in the past, LSAC has a lot of signal. And this year, they're disseminating still a good amount of signal, which is their volume summary data. 
but they're also disseminating a lot of noise, which has nothing to do with any helpful information to you all. That noise comes in the form of, please don't panic, things are going to come down. And my concern is that multiple data experts we've talked do not see it playing out to the extent that LSIC keeps publicly claiming it's going to come down. Yes, things are going to come down. We're not going to have a 110% increase in LSAT scores, 175 to 180. But we are going to have a disproportionate increase. LSIC recently said in the media that they project applications will only increase 10% this year by the end of the year. We don't see that at all. We think it'll be significantly higher. My point is, to the extent that it seems like a few, quote, experts, end of quote, or signaling to the applicant pool out there, hey, things are going to look normal. I wouldn't think of this as a normal cycle. I would think of this as, if anything, I need to look at a few more schools because all the data shows this is an extraordinarily competitive cycle. I know that's not reassuring. And I've done podcasts. In fact, the last one I did was on sort of the good news and the calming news. But as much as it's not reassuring, it bothers me to the end of the earth that just to prove a point, people are giving applicants misinformation, disinformation, or highly speculative and biased information. So I wanted to end this note on sort of what we see as the sort of transparent information about the cycle. If you're applying to schools where you're at their current medians, their medians are likely going to go up. So maybe just add a couple schools in. That was my second PSA. This was Mike Spivey at the Spivey Consulting Group. I hope this was helpful. 